John. Welcome, everybody. I'm John Haig. I am the co-director of the Mosava Romani Center for Business and Government. Uh, thank you all for coming. I think we're competing against, uh, across the hall, the why the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. Um, but they don't realize that none of that will really matter if you don't figure out mergers and acquisitions uh, and deal with the antitrust issues of big tech. So they're lost. But um, we're fortunate today. This is the uh, another in the kind of series on tech and regulation. Um, <clears throat> we will have another session on Wednesday, uh, which I will encourage you to all come to as well. Um, today, the title is The Urge to Merge, Implications for Big Tech. And if you're following any of this uh, work that's going on, we had, uh, thanks to Nancy and John Sallet, uh, Tom Wheeler and Jean, I'll talk about in a second, um, we had a panel that we put on, a couple panels that we put on for the uh, Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission on the new merger guidelines um, that, that had been uh, drafted and are now finalized. And so we'll have a little bit of conversation about that today. Um, the two main people today, John Salad is a senior fellow here at the center. Um, he was general counsel of the FCC. He happened to work for the person sitting in the front row here, Tom, Tom Wheeler, who had been the chairman of the FCC. Um, he's also been um, the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Litigation in the Antitrust Division uh, at the DOJ and Office of Policy and Strategic Planning for the U.S. Department of Commerce. So breadth of perspective, uh, he brings the legal side of the discussion uh, to some extent and any, any kind of actions or issues you're dealing with mergers, you're going to have to have legal and economic perspective. Um, <clears throat> and then Nancy Rose who is a visiting scholar here at MRCBG. Um, while we may put that first, I'm not sure it's top of, top of her resume. She's the Charles Kindleberger Professor in the MIT Economics Department, had been the chair of the Economics Department there, focuses on industrial organization, competition policy, and the economics of regulation. Um, she also has some very practical experience in the sense that she was Deputy Assistant Attorney General for economic analysis in the DOJ Antitrust Division uh, from 2014 to 2016. So uh, we are fortunate to have the two of them. We also have our usual uh, Tom Wheeler and Gene Kimmelman, both of whom have extensive experience in the communication sector, antitrust issues more broadly. Um, with that, I will turn it over to John. Thank you both for coming and spending the, spending the time. I'm actually going to preempt John. So, so thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, John and I are always extremely ambitious in what we think we're gonna be able to cover, particularly because we'd like to leave time for questions at the end. Um, so I will say, uh, hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end, but if you've got a burning question as I run through the slides, um, feel free to, to raise your hand and we can deal with it um, as we go. So we're gonna start with a discussion. We're gonna jump right in. I'm not gonna tell you that there are thousands upon thousands of mergers each year. There are, I'm not gonna tell you that the deal value globally is in the trillions of dollars, which it is. Um, what we're gonna focus on today is a kind of practical guide to how mergers are assessed. There's going to be a strong US focus, but not exclusively US focus. And the way the US um, evaluates mergers from an antitrust perspective is broadly similar to the way um, uh, many other jurisdictions, most notably the European Commission and the Competition and Market Authority in the UK, um, evaluate merger, though the legal institutions differ somewhat um, across these. But I'm going to start with the economics, which is pretty similar across jurisdictions. So what drives the urge to merge? If you were an industrial organization economist, as I am, or an antitrust practitioner, as John and I um, both have been, um, you're going to tend to focus on two factors. One, in red, cautionary, which is a drive for more market power. So companies may want to merge to eliminate or foreclose competition or to raise rivals' costs or to somehow give themselves the ability to earn higher profits through the exercise of market power. That's anti-competitive and the antitrust laws or competition policy laws are intended to prevent those types of mergers. The second in green are efficiencies. So companies tend to tell you that mergers are all about efficiencies. Um, companies will tell you they're all about synergies and sometimes they mean 
cost synergies. So if we merge, we're going to reduce our costs or we're going to develop better processes or develop better products. Companies will also mean by synergies, revenue synergies, which is really more about market power. So, so we tend in economics not to use synergies because they're a little ambiguous what's meant by that. So we'll think about this, this market power versus efficiencies. But if I were a corporate finance economist, I'd be focused not on these antitrust issues, um, but on a variety of other possible explanations for mergers. One broad category are what are sometimes called pecuniary gains. So these aren't real resource gains or real resource transfers. They're kind of, you know, maybe we get better diversification from the merger, or there's a company that has a lot of embedded tax losses that it isn't going to be able to take advantage of. So if I'm a profitable company, I might buy that tax loss company, and then I'm able to, to deduct those losses on my corporate income tax and reduce my tax burden. Maybe there's an incentive to reduce bankruptcy risk. Sometimes mergers are um, uh, pursued to enable the firm to abrogate contracts, in particular union contracts, because if I buy another firm, the union agreement with that target firm um, uh, is voided. So there are a set of, um, of these kind of pecuniary gains or financial engineering gains that corporate finance economists think about. Um, another class of explanation that the corporate finance literature looks at is information asymmetry. Maybe I have better information that tells me that the current market value of a target company is below its actual economic value. And so I'm going to buy low, realize that greater value, and, and that um, those benefits accrue to me as the acquirer. Um, and then there's a, a final class of explanations that tend to be um, a bit more discouraging to both economists, IO economists, and financial economists, but for which antitrust authorities typically have nothing to say. These would, would span a kind of broad class of explanations I call empire building. So CEOs want to run bigger companies because it makes them feel better or because their compensation goes up, which it does. Um, or because it gives them more political power. Um, it might just be that there's a growth expectation and it's hard to grow organically, so I'm going to go buy companies because my shareholders can't distinguish between um, acquisitive and organic growth. Um, or maybe there's just a lot of hubris. I think I can identify undervalued targets, so I'm going to go on a buying spree. Maybe I'm actually not very good at that, in fact, but it's going to take a long time for people to figure <laughs> that out. So while there are a lot of explanations for mergers um, that might be relevant in certain situations, we're going to focus on these antitrust relevant ones today. So if we think about market power, I want to classify mergers into two broad categories. The first are horizontal mergers. Think of those as mergers of rivals or an acquisition of a competitor. Whether it's an actual competitor or a potential competitor, we'll talk a bit more about in just a second. Um, and so JetBlue Spirit, which was recently blocked by a federal district court judge here in Boston, um, would have combined two airlines that overlapped in a lot of the routes that they serve. So they were head-to-head -head competitors, and the judge in this um, uh, challenge by DOJ um, uh, blocked the merger, saying it was going to harm consumers by reducing competition between these two carriers, particularly harmful to kind of more cost conscious or, or budget constrained um, consumers. You're gonna hear more if you come back on Wednesday about JetBlue Spirit. We're going to have Tasneem Chipney, who was one of the DOJ economic experts in that case. And she'll talk a bit about mergers kind of broadly, but also through the lens of this particular merger. So those are mergers of rivals. And most of the challenges um, are of horizontal mergers. Um, uh, and uh, I'll talk in a minute about why that is the case. Um, the second kind of mergers uh, that raise antitrust, potential antitrust concerns are called, we would typically call vertical mergers, or we could think about them as mergers of complements. So vertical, because we might think about firms that are linked along a supply chain and say a supplier buys a downstream manufacturer or a downstream manufacturer integrates up into supply, or maybe a manufacturer integrates down into distribution. So we could think about arraying these along a supply chain, and the mergers are taking place upstream or, or, or downstream. 
These raise issues when they're acquiring an asset that's used by rival firms. Um, and, uh, and a concern is that that type of merger might foreclose access um, to say an input that rivals might need or be used to raise rivals costs. So the Illumina Grail merger um, that was recently um, after a very, very long and uh, uh, Byzantine um, set of antitrust investigations and challenges that was recently undone is an example of a vertical merger where here the, the kind of core concern um, was that um, by merging uh, Illumina and Grail, um, we would reduce innovation um, for, uh, for rivals of the company. All right, so I told you, you know, we worry about market power, um, but on the other hand, we might like mergers if they create efficiencies. So what are those sources of those efficiencies? We're thinking about combining companies here that create better products, better in the sense of lower cost. So if there are economies of scale, larger companies are able to produce at a lower um, unit cost or economies of scope combining production of multiple products inside a single firm um, reduces their costs, um, then maybe we realize the benefits of having products that are produced um, uh, at, at lower resource costs. You know, a second type of efficiency might be improving access to capital. We think of that as reducing the capital cost, perhaps. Um, a third type of efficiency might be replacing either inferior management or inefficient management Maybe I know how to, to, to run um, uh, electric power plants particularly well. And so I can go around acquiring inefficient power plants, re-engineer those power plants to make them more efficient, use less fuel. That's got a benefit in terms of lower price, lower cost electricity. Also, um, if they're fossil plants, um, lower environmental hits um, from those plants. And so that might be a benefit of, of um, somebody with my particular talents um, acquiring um, those um, generating units. Um, so if we've got these sort of good reasons for mergers from an, a competition perspective and not so good reasons, um, how do we think about those? Oliver Williamson in 1968 posited that there was a kind of classic market power efficiency trade-off. And his argument in this 1968 article was that antitrust authorities who were very focused on market power kind of had this down, that efficiencies would be much more significant in thinking about the overall welfare effect of a merger, and agencies should therefore spend a lot more time thinking about efficiencies than they did. So what did Williamson do? Williamson said, let's think about an industry that initially is perfectly competitive. So we've got a demand curve here and a marginal cost zero at the initial point, and price is equal to marginal cost because the industry is perfectly competitive. So those of you who've taken you know, think back to your introductory economics class. If you've got price-taking firms, price is equal to marginal cost, um, uh, output is determined by where those cross, that gives us this competitive quantity QC. And he says, let's think about the most market power that the merger could create. Let's think about a merger to monopoly, All right? So if we've got a monopolist, the monopolist is now thinking about its marginal revenue curve. That's derived from the demand curve. And he says, let's suppose that this merger to monopoly, which increases market power a ton, right? We go from perfectly competitive to a monopoly outcome, also reduces marginal cost. So it creates efficiencies. And let's suppose it lowers marginal cost to MQ1, all right? So the monopolist is going to produce where marginal revenue crosses the marginal cost curve. That's gonna lead the monopolist to choose a, a lower output than the competitive industry, QM. Price is going to go up to PM. But, Williamson observes, we're going to have these huge cost savings that are created because marginal costs have declined from MC0 to MC1. So we're going to save all of these resources we no longer need to use to produce this product. That's a benefit. There's a transfer from consumers to producers. That's this light rectangle that I've labeled transfer because consumers are paying a higher price. And then there's a deadweight loss that's associated with the output restriction because we're not 
um, selling all of the units for which consumers are willing to pay at least as much as it costs us to produce them. So Williamson focuses on the cost savings, which are a welfare gain, and the deadweight loss, which is a welfare loss. And if we were thinking about total welfare, the sum of producer surplus and consumer surplus, Williamson more or less says, rectangles are bigger than triangles, so we should care more about these efficiencies, All right? This is the, the insight that he generates to say, competition authority should spend more time focused on efficiencies and efficiency gains for mergers. Is that what we do? Well, no. And that's because in most jurisdictions, these antitrust agencies apply a consumer welfare standard. So if they were looking at this merger, they would say this merger is presumptively illegal because it harms consumers. It raises price, so consumers lose not only this deadweight loss that Williamson acknowledges, but they lose all of this upper rectangle that I've labeled transfer. That's going from consumers to producers. And if we have a consumer welfare standard, consumers are worse off. It doesn't matter that profits have gone up down here from the antitrust perspective. That's a, that's a policy decision. It's not an economic decision. Economists don't gen, aren't generally very good at making normative um, uh, trade-offs, normative statements. Um, and so if we think about what an antitrust authority would do, they would say, if we're going back to look at this merger to monopoly, then the criteria is, do marginal costs or efficiencies, or efficiency gains large enough so that after we go from price equals marginal cost, demand crossing the marginal cost curve for the competitive sector, to the lower marginal cost that the monopolist has, but now the monopolist setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, does price go up, down, or stay the same? So in this example, the marginal cost reduction would have to be at least as large as what I've labeled on this graph in order to keep consumers as well off post-merger as they were prior to the merger. And that would be the criteria. Are there large enough efficiency gains that consumers are at least as well off as they would have been without the merger? And in this case, you no know, firms would realize the benefit of lower marginal costs from the acquisition. So that's the consumer welfare standard. Basically, if we were thinking about it just in a price context, though there's no reason to focus exclusively on price, the consumer welfare standard doesn't say all we care about is price. We care about product quality, we care about innovation, we care about kind of dynamic price paths. But if, if this were a sector where price was the, the out, outcome variable we cared most about, then what we just have to say is do we expect price to go up or to stay the same or fall after the merger? And if price goes up, we'd wanna challenge the merger under antitrust laws. If the price goes down, we might say, well, looks like the efficiency is more than off offset the anti-competitive effect. So, what are the theories of harm in horizontal mergers? And this is, by the way, these are, these are horizontal mergers because I'm talking about combining competitors into, say, a monopoly. Um, so horizontal uh, merger theories of harm are varied, um, but they're thinking about what the competitive consequence is from eliminating an actual or potential competitor. And we tend to, to economists tend to define those in two categories, what are called unilateral incentives, so that's just when I take two firms, um, JetBlue and Spirit, who are formerly competing, and I combine them into one, what does that combination do to the incentive for JetBlue and Spirit to change, say, to raise their price, right? And so we call that upward pricing pressure because now JetBlue doesn't have to worry if it raised its price about the customers it loses to Spirit because it's gonna get the benefit of those customers going to Spirit. Similarly, Spirit doesn't have to worry when it raises a pr its price about the customers it loses to JetBlue because that's gonna, those profits are going to come back to the combined firm. So they still worry about customers that they lose to American or Frontier or Delta. But the fact that we've internalized the competitive effects between these two is going to tend to increase prices. They say here, I call it upward pricing pressure. That's, that's the way the merger guidelines historically kind of focus. Um, but Competition law doesn't just protect 
downstream customers of the merged entities. It also protect, protects suppliers to the merged companies. So if you had a merger of buyers, and that was going to enable them to pay, say, lower wages because they were competing in the same labor market, or to pay lower prices to, say, hospitals if it's a merger of health insurers, or to pay authors less in a merger of publishers, um, those mergers are also actionable because it's reducing competition. And in that case, we'd worry about this kind of downward pricing pressure. As I said, price isn't all we care about. We might think about product quality or variety. We might think about innovation. We might think about the elimination of, a, of an entrant or potential entrant one entry niche, um, which would reduce dynamic competition. So a whole host of things that the antitrust authorities are um, uh, empowered to consider. Some of them are easier to evaluate kind of quantitatively. And so in systems like the US, where you have to go to court and convince a federal district court judge that the merger is anti-competitive, you might have an easier time with things that are easier to quantify than you do with things that are, are less quantifiable um, or more qualitative. So these are all unilateral incentives, but the second broad class of, of effects that we might worry about are what we call coordinated effects. So the simplest one would be if JetBlue and Spirit combine and each raise their price, then the best response of their rivals of Delta, Frontier, United American is going to be also raise their price, right? If your rivals raise, raise their prices and you're competing in prices, your best response is going to be to, to increase your price. And so we would call that a coordinated effect where we don't think about just the effect of the merging companies, but also the effect on rivals prices. Um, but we might worry that it's not just a kind of unilateral you know, best response to the higher price that the merging companies are, are um, imposing, but we might worry even more about the merger making it easier to sustain tacit collusion or explicit collusion. The difference being explicit, you're sitting down and reaching a formal agreement with your rival, tacit is something where I understand how my decisions affect you, you understand how your decisions affect me, and we just um, each act in a way that softens competition to enable us to raise our price. This, I think, is very difficult to overstate the importance of. It's hard to prove in court the kind of how a merger with the delta effect on tacit collusion, but a merger challenge is basically the last defense against tacit collusion because antitrust laws do not generally ban tacit collusion. While they're very strict in most jurisdictions against explicit agreements not to compete, if we just have an understanding of our interdependence in kind of an oligopoly setting um, and we soften competition and we raise prices as a consequence of that, um, there's not an antitrust recourse um, in most jurisdictions for that. So if we're worried about tacit collusion, we should be very aggressively enforcing merger policy. All right, so how does this upward pricing pressure that I've kind of described as, as one of the main unilateral effects, um, uh, how, how do we understand that? This is from the closing, from a slide in the closing arguments the DOJ made. Um, here, not in the JetBlue Spirit merger, but if you went back a year before JetBlue Spirit, JetBlue and American had agreed to not quite a merger, but an alliance that looked a lot like a merger. That also was challenged by the DOJ successfully here in Boston. And this is the slide that they used to illustrate for the court what the effect was. So if JetBlue raised its price, some of its passengers will divert to American, some to Delta, some may choose not to fly on a route if those are the only other options. And while the ones who divert to Delta are lost profits for JetBlue regardless of the alliance, the ones that divert to American are still going to, to be um, provide revenue for JetBlue because this alliance shared the revenue between JetBlue and American. It was effectively like a merger. There was a revenue sharing agreement. Um, and so the fact that this price increase would allow JetBlue to recapture some of those customers is what's generating this pressure to, to raise prices post-merger. American would have a similar one. Um, uh, we just flipped the, the positions of JetBlue and American. Um, 
All right, so not broadly horizontal, what about vertical? So I said vertical are kind of thinking about acquisitions of suppliers or customers. And I told you before that the, the theories of harm that we were worried about, the market power concerns that we have in vertical mergers, um, tend to come in the flavor of first raising rivals costs. So if I buy a supplier that also supplies you, I might have an incentive to raise the price that that supplier charges you because that's going to increase your costs. That's gonna make you wanna charge a higher price or reduce your output. And I'm gonna be able to, as a consequence, either increase my price um, or expand my output relative to you and realize greater profits. Um, a second kind of more extreme version of this would be maybe the incentives are sufficient, but I'd wanna just completely foreclose your access to that input, and you might not be able to compete at all in the market, right? It's gonna be harder to do that, both in terms of the incentives, um, you know, what's the, what's the return to me of completely denying you access to this company that used to provide you with an input, um, if we were just thinking about price competition, but often we're very concerned about foreclosure, and maybe it's not complete foreclosure, maybe it's just worse terms of access, um, in the innovation market. So for instance, when I was at DOJ, there was a case that involved a semiconductor equipment manufacturer acquiring or proposing to acquire a company that produced metrology equipment that was going to measure whether the, the chip manufacturing equipment sort of met the standards of, of the semiconductor um, uh, chip manufacturers. And the concern was that as chips get you know, ever smaller and more powerful, you need to be able to demonstrate to say Intel, the main customer at that point, now might be NVIDIA um, for, for um, chip manufacturing equipment, you need to demonstrate that you can meet these new standards, these new kind of technology frontiers. And so if I wanted to advantage myself as an equipment manufacturer against my rivals, maybe all I'd do is just slow down your access to the metrology equipment because you'd be then a few months behind me and that might be enough to get me the Intel contracts or the NVIDIA contracts. So that kind of foreclosure doesn't have to be complete and permanent, it can just be temporary and still have um, significant effects. Um, on the other hand, there are reasons to think that vertical mergers might produce efficiencies. So the kind of poster child efficiency in economics and in antitrust law is what's called elimination of double marginalization. Basically, if we've got market power at each point in the supply chain, then each firm is setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. Each firm is marking up its price over its marginal cost. And so as I move down the chain, I've got markups upon markups upon markups. That leads to, to higher prices. In fact, you can get prices that are above the integrated monopoly price. And so it can actually benefit consumers as well as firms to integrate along this vertical supply chain to internalize the market power so that you have just one firm with market power. Um, and that could potentially reduce final prices and expand output. But economists have come up with a lot of other ways of thinking about vertical integration as well. And sometimes vertical integration might be desirable because it eliminates holdup problems. Think a uh, power plant that's located at the mouth of a, coal, of a coal mine, right? You might think about once we were each sunk our investment, the power plant built at the coal mine mouth, the coal mine decided not to invest in railroad spurs to haul its coal, to ship its coal someplace else, that now we might have a holdup problem where I, if I threaten to stop dealing with you, the value of your investment is nothing, right? And so integration might be a way of mitigating holdup problems um, or anticipation of those holdup problems might dictate integration. Um, and, and there are a whole other class of explanations that deal with reducing contracting or transactions costs. So again, we're going to have to balance the kind of market power theory of harm and the efficiencies as we think about antitrust. So this is an example of this, what's called vertical arithmetic from the AT&T Time Warner Media merger that the Department of Justice unsuccessfully challenged in 2017. But never fear, 
AT&T managed to make a hash of it. And so a few short years later, they had to sell off the Time Warner Media assets um, at a discount. Sometimes when we're protecting consumers at the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission, we're also protecting shareholders from um, idiotic mistakes that CEOs make um, for whatever reason. So this was the way the DOJ's expert Carl Shapiro analyzed this merger. He said, well, the integration of Time Warner Media with AT&T's DirecTV satellite um, distributor um, would eliminate double marginalization and could reduce the price that DirecTV might charge. But on the other hand, it would create incentives to raise the cost of rival um, uh, media distributors, um, uh, multi um, uh, video providers um, like Comcast, Charter, and Dish, um, as it raised the cost of this content to these um, competitors, some of the customers, say of Comcast, might decide that they'd like to, to purchase their um, television services. This is so quaint, right back in the pre-streaming era, like who even knows what these are anymore, but uh, from DirecTV. And that diversion can increase um, uh, profits for direct TV. Um, so, so Shapiro analyzed this and said that he thought the net effect, of, he found that the net effect of this merger would be to harm consumers, um, that, that these efficiencies were not sufficient to outweigh the harm created um, by the incentive to raise rivals' costs. The judge said the AT&T and Time Warner executives told me they'd never do this. I, you know, they look like honest people to me. I'm going to let the merger go through. Um, okay, I'm going to close and turn it over to John, but with one cautionary tale. So if we look at antitrust um, enforcement, there are relatively few cases in which a merger that seemed to have anti-competitive effects was, a, was explicitly investigated and then allowed to proceed on the basis of efficiencies. So the, the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division at DOJ, who are the two US enforcers, tend to be pretty skeptical of efficiency arguments. Um, and here's a reason why perhaps they're not even skeptical enough. So um, there's a, a um, 2008 proposal between SAB Miller and Molson Coors to form a joint venture. It's essentially a merger in the US, but it's just of their US assets. So to combine into Molson Coors. And they argue convincingly to DOJ that there are enormous efficiencies. And in large part, those are because Coors is brewed in Golden, Colorado. Um, it has basically that one brewery in Colorado. Um, it has to be shipped refrigerated from the time it's produced until the time it's consumed. Um, and that as shipping refrigerated beer is pretty expensive. So by brewing Coors across the country in, um, in the Miller breweries, um, they can lower the distribution, transportation distribution costs and lower the cost of delivering Coors. So, you know, DOJ evaluated the claims that the parties came in to, to demonstrate these efficiencies, found those persuasive. There's a 2015 Rand Journal article by Orly Eschenfilter and others that says, in fact, yes, these efficiencies are real, they are realized. And they are sufficient to offset any expected upward pricing pressure from combining Miller cores, eliminating the competition between Miller and cores. So, you know, DOJ allows it to proceed. There's some ex post evidence that says, yes, the efficiencies were realized, but that's not the end of the story. So there's a paper um, by uh, Nate Miller, no relation to Miller cores, to SAB Miller, and uh, Matt Weinberg, um, that starts with this graph. Here's the prices of Miller Lite, Coors Light, and Bud Light. So those are the light beers produced by, by SAB Miller, um, uh, Coors, and, um, uh, and AB, uh, Anheuser-Busch, and Bev. Um, and you're seeing kind of this downward trend until you get to the joint venture. And then there's this jump up. And then they're basically, they look pretty flat, right? So this very substantial jump following the joint venture. You don't see that in Corona or Heineken, who you might think of as competitors to that. They sort of continue on that downward trend. So Miller and Weinberg look at this and say, 
huh, what happened to those efficiencies that were supposed to prevent us from seeing price increases? And so the basic story that they tell is one of Anheuser-Busch and, and Molson Coors, Miller Coors, learning to cooperate, learning to tacitly collude, right? And so they estimate this kind of cooperation parameter that they call kappa that's, that's going up kind of post the joint venture. And they estimate a structural model of demand and of costs, and then use this to simulate what prices would have looked like under alternative behavioral assumptions. It looks really messy, but here's the takeaway. The, the black is the actual price. So you saw before from that previous graph, prices were trending down, and then you see an increase after the joint venture, right? So that's kind of this flat curve of actual prices. This one is for Miller Lite, but they do it for, for each of the beers. The blue are what we would have expected prices to be given the efficiencies, but no effect on competition. But we know there's an effect on competition because Miller and Coors are now into our joint venture, but essentially you know, co, co maximizing the joint profits. And the red is what you would have seen given the incentive for Miller and Coors to coordinate their profits, but also the red would have been if they were perfectly uh, colluding with Anheuser-Busch. And what they observe is that the actual price path is a lot closer to this price path that would be expected if you were tacitly coordinating with the third major beer company, Anheuser-Busch, than what you would have expected if you just saw the joint venture but no effect on what was happening with Anheuser-Busch. Right? So essentially, when I told you before that what we had to really worry about in merger policy was the effect on tacit collusion, this was something where Nobody denies the efficiencies were present. The efficiencies um, uh, would have been enough to keep the prices low, even combining more cores. So we would have been in that picture where, you know, the price the marginal costs were going down so much the price wouldn't have changed. But the price did change, and it changed because of this tacit collusion or tacit cooperation. It appears. Um, and so I'll leave you with that, and John will talk about what the, how the law assesses this. Thank you. Is this working? Do I have this working? So I want to try to, time we have, I want to try to do three things. Take questions if there are any, and if not, you have to hear a fourth thing. So you choose. Do um, you have a question, sir? Please. the collusion and you're like okay this measure is harmful to consumers even though we let it go so you have to like the merger or break down break up post merger that's the first question and i have two other questions the second one is what's the effect of ppp price prices will always go up everybody knows that so how does in terms of the calculation of what is beneficial to consumers or, or not around price increase how do you bring in ppp effects which is being fair to the producers anyway. And the third question is, sometimes some consumers are satisfied when they pay higher prices for the same, for the same product. So in terms of cost, customer satisfaction, are paying an higher price for the same thing, is that also like brought into the picture in the evaluation? Yeah, thank you. You wanna do that? You wanna do pricing? We posit. Antitrust authorities posit that consumers aren't happier paying higher prices for exactly the same thing. Now, if the product's a better product, you might be willing to pay more for it. But if it's exactly the same product, you know, maybe there's a behavioral explanation. You don't notice the price has gone up, but the, the consumer welfare standard basically says if price is going up for the same product, the merger's anti-competitive. So that would not be a defense. Um, uh, in terms of the... Right, remind me what your first question was because I think that was the one I had most to say about. Oh, right. So, so that's, a, that's a very complicated question. It turns out that it is extremely difficult to break up a company. John's going to talk about that in just a minute. This is why we have pre-merger notification that you're not, 
you have to tell us you're going to merge and, and the competition authorities get to look at it before you actually consummate it because it's very difficult once a merger has been um, uh, consummated to, to kind of unscramble the eggs, as it were. Um, the F, an example of this is the FTC's Kate monopolization case against Facebook for its acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp um, and the ad tech cases against Google, um, where even if the companies are found to have monopolized, it's not clear that there's an effective remedy that can or will be implemented. So it's, it's, it's complicated. There are occasionally divestitures in or breakups and consummated mergers, but they're very rare. Well, let me start with that and then move on. In, in Europe and the United States, certain mergers, think big mergers, require pre-merger notification. You've got to tell the agencies about it. Not so in the United Kingdom. These places, the agencies have the chance to stop the mergers before they close, before they go into effect. Why? A very noted antitrust lawyer named Bill Baer, for whom both Nancy and I worked at the Department of Justice, who told this story about a case called El Paso. Before the United States had pre-merger notification, two natural gas companies, one's going to compete against the other, so the other one buys the one that's a competitive threat. No competition, preserves this monopoly. No pre-merger notification required. So the Department of Justice goes to court. Seven years later, the court says, I'm going to order the divestiture of that other company right away. Ten years later, the divestiture is accomplished. This was viewed as not a good way for the antitrust laws to work. And so the United States and Europe, very similarly, went to a, the system we now have of mergers of a similar, of a big enough size, and the criteria are slightly different between the two jurisdictions, have to say first to agencies, here's what we're planning on doing. And then the question is, what do the agencies do? Well, they, interestingly, across the jurisdictions, there's a pretty similar legal standard. In Europe, we looked at whether significantly the merger would significantly impede effective competition. In the UK, would the merger result in substantial lessening of competition? In almost identical words in the United States uh, law, the Clayton Act, would an acquisition substantially lessen competition? In all of these, what the merger authorities are trying to do, typically before the merger closes, is say, OK, is the harm going to be greater than the benefits? This is all prediction, right? It's two kinds of prediction. What would happen if the company merged? And what would happen if the company didn't merge? And we're going to do a couple of case studies to show that that's what happens. It's very difficult. Yes, sir. One and then you. I thought the legal standard the US applies is the consumer welfare standard. At least the Chicago school, I believe, is what's actually the law. Not this is the actual legal standard. As a lawyer, if I look it up in, on the statute books of the United States, what is typically done traditionally since the rise of the Chicago school in, say, the late 70s is what's called the Chicago school. What Nancy described as consumer welfare, not the Chicago school sometimes did what the original Williamson diagram did, but sort of became consumer welfare. Consumer welfare is a doctrine or a theory or sometimes used by the court, but it is not the legal standard. And that's important because somebody like me doesn't actually think the consumer welfare standard does a good job in telling us what is actually happening to competition. And I get to debate about that and maybe even persuade a judge somebody. Who knows? I should say, I should have said the Gasset, since I work for State Attorney General's office, believe me, what I'm saying today about this and everything else is only my own opinion. Right? No claim there. But this is the legal standard. So then, how do we make this? How do, what do we think about efficiency? All the points Nancy's made. Nancy and I wrote an article about this that was published a few years ago that the dichotomous treatment of efficiencies in horizontal mergers. 
Nancy, let me take the title. She, she did all the substantive work. The dichotomy is this. What we think happens historically is that agencies thinking about mergers before they close are too inclined to think there will be benefit, that there will be efficiencies. But then they sue and big companies and defense lawyers say, oh, well, they're not giving efficiencies enough credit. It's because they're, they're suing. A lot of this is because of scarce agency resources only for the ones that are the most concentrated, the ones where the harm is most overwhelming and where, therefore, a justification will be harder to come by. Now, we thought we had done okay on it. Not everybody did. The United States Chamber of Commerce commissioned a paper by two well-known antitrust lawyers. First part, professors Nancy Rose and Jonathan Salad, both considered thought leaders in the progressive antitrust movement. Neither of us have ever described either of us that way, but okay. But then a criticism. The salad and rose, the rose and salad, because it's alphabetical order. The rose and salad piece selectively cites some of the research that looks for and fails to find efficiencies and other competitive benefits after mergers, but it largely relies on papers investigating whether merger efficiencies outweigh changes in market power. Yes, we did a literature review. We looked at reviews of mergers, different kind of mergers, we looked at some, like the Miller piece, reviews of specific mergers. And this is what we looked for. Do the merger efficiencies outweigh changes in market power? And basically what we found was the agencies we thought were too prone to think so. And that as the merger guidelines went along, there were, we thought, very likely too few mergers not in quantity, but in the sense that five to four mergers, people think, oh, well, you can't do them until Gene Kimmelman came to the Department of Justice and the Penguin Random House Simon & Schuster merger was black, which was five to four. So how the agencies think about this in this review is critical. But let me then talk about uh, two cases. I'm gonna, I'll come back to this in a minute because it illustrates this. Um, starting off with sort of what happens in the world. This is a slide from a study the OECD just released, looking at, uh, in the world last year, mergers that were prohibited. It's just one year, it's a snapshot, but it's sort of along the lines that Nancy was describing. 170 plus prohibitions out of a unilateral horizon, right? Merger creates a powerful company, raises a lot less of coordinated, the Miller Kerr's story Nancy told. And vertical, which she described, you can see, you know, something like less than a fourth of horizon. Vertical mergers historically have gotten a lot less attention in the United States, particularly a long multi-decade gap between challenges to vertical mergers. But there are more being done now. And here's a recent example, Microsoft Activision. I want to take a minute and talk about this. So I think people know this, but uh, who here plays games, video games? Oh, great, okay. I, I don't, somebody help me as I go through this, okay? Microsoft, among other things, sells gaming consoles and offers a platform for cloud-based streaming, right? You don't have to download, you don't have to buy the old floppy disk, you don't have to download the game. Activision, a very popular creator of games, Call of Duty, a very successful game. Uh, in Jan by one study in January of this year, a version of Call of Duty was the most popular video game in the world. Of course, Activision creates the content that's used by any platform that you get to play the game on. It can be a console, could be a PC, gaming PC, with your own special cooling systems installed, could be a mobile phone where the computing is done in the cloud and the results, so to speak, are streamed to you. And it's gen it was generally accepted in this analysis that Activision has important content with competitive consequences. That's one way of saying these other guys need 
Let's assume that because nobody actually debated that then. But was was debated was I'm going to skip consoles. I'll skip when I come back. Is really interesting discussion on cloud gaming. Okay, the advantage of cloud gaming is you don't have to have a powerful computing device and you don't have to have a special purpose device like a console. It works on your phone. Um, it's growing because mobile is becoming the primary way that things are done online. Microsoft offers its own cloud gaming system. It's got competition from Amazon and NVIDIA and others, but Amazon and NVIDIA identified as particular one challenges. But pre-merger, Activision did not put its content in cloud game. So the fundamental question the legal system has to decide is what happens if there's a merger and what happens if there isn't a merger? And here's a split. The CMA in the United Kingdom concludes that if there were no merger, Activision would likely put its content on cloud gaming, right? It, even though it wasn't on it at the time. And yet if the merger occurred, the other prediction, Microsoft would have an incentive to keep cloud gaming rivals from getting active, right? Microsoft's got its own cloud gaming platform. The theory is that content is important, so Microsoft puts it on its cloud gaming platform, keeps it off others, thereby giving its cloud gaming platform an advantage in the marketplace, in a new and growing marketplace. A, U a U.S. court rejecting a lawsuit filed by the Federal Trade Commission goes exactly to the opposite. Activision would not put its content on cloud gaming, the court says, and Microsoft has promised to do so, so that benefits competition. Just think about this. A second. There's two things going on here. We'll act, what would Activision do if it remains an independent company and a changing marketplace? Microsoft, when the deal gets done, makes contracts and says to some people, we'll supply it in the console space, Sony PlayStation. Here, five different cloud games. This is a long 10 year license. We're going to give it to you. So Microsoft says, no problem. Here's the difference. And I'll go into more detail. The competition market authority in the UK looks deep into the evolution of the cloud gaming industry and Activision's past experience and says, yeah, that market's going to get really big and important. They will end up putting their content on in the cloud. They can't avoid it. This is my land. They can't avoid it when this market gets so big. So the fact that they weren't doing it in the past doesn't tell us the future. What the future is, is mobile. Then contracts. So think about it. Emerging company says, I've signed a 10-year contract. Everything's going to be fine. Everybody gets active. The court, U.S. court says, ah, great. Done. The competition markets authority said, not good enough. Why? Contracts can be breached. Contracts might not be enforced. Maybe micro, micro, Microsoft is the bigger player, and so it doesn't feel like complying, and what's the other party going to do about it? Well, maybe, and we don't know what this means, really, because a lot of the specifics were not publicly released. Maybe the comp contract has loopholes. And, and by the way, the contract is between two private parties. The government loses the ability to take any action. So the United States court and the CMA go in opposite directions on these two questions. And this ends up to be being the way the decision comes up. I'll skip that because here's the reasoning. The US court says in December of 2023, before the merger, right, Activision wasn't on cloud games. Microsoft promises access to five cloud streaming competitors. Activision is not likely to make its games available. And we know that because there was a beta test with NVIDIA and Activision after a week pulled its game off. And 
really, I call this a static interpretation. Past is still love. In the past, given the market conditions, Activision didn't want its stuff on cloud gaming, so that's the way it's going to be. The CMA agrees Activision wasn't in the cloud, but it says, you were just saying, these contracts are not a guarantee of competitive fairness because uncertainty in the content and execution. It looks at the evidence, it comes to the opposite conclusion. Activision would likely put its games in the cloud. It looks at the same data test that the US, which said, shows Activision won't do it. It said, no. What it does show is that it's technically feasible to do it. So if the economics are there, Activision will likely do it. And I call this a dynamic interpretation because it assumes that the future is different. And in that different world, the incentives for the companies would be different. So what actually happens here is we had three outcomes. Right now in the United States, the district court told the FCC, FTC, the less situation, um, the FTC, you lose, nothing, they get to close. The EU blocks the deal until there's a, an agreement to license cloud gaming. And the UK, again, in a series of proceedings, says, nope, we're going to block it until Microsoft agrees to divest, divest the cloud gaming rights to a third party everywhere but Europe. So the United States is getting the benefit of the UK decree. Europe is getting the decree put in motion by the EU. And CMA says, and this goes to your question about remedies, the only way we're going to be comfortable that competition is not harmed is if somebody else owns these rights. And fundamentally, that is what happened. I'm going to take a minute and do one other piece. Um, because I know we're going to be short for time. But, 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 but I want to, just to sum this up, we're balancing in merger, pre, with this pre-review, we're balancing harm against benefits, efficiencies, in two worlds that have not yet happened, merger, no merger, and we're letting lawyers, okay? A complicated and difficult process, but informed a great deal by economic analysis. But you gotta remember, it's always a prediction and it's always a risk. What risk are we prepared to take and which way will we take it? Going back to the Chicago School, a fundamental tenet of the Chicago School was, you always want to take a risk that allows the monopoly. And the swing away from the Chicago School has been a reallocation of the risk, saying, no, 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 monopolies are powerful, they're embedded, they're durable, they don't go away easily. You've got you to assume that the risk is with monopoly. Well, let me then talk about one last case, um, potential competition. Potential competition is really important. When I was at the Department of Justice in the Antitrust Division in 2016, there was somebody who was go walking the halls all the time saying, we're not thinking enough about potential competition. We're not thinking enough about whether big monopolies see a company that might be a threat in the future isn't now, so we're going to buy it so it can never become a threat. That was Nancy. He went around and told all of us we needed to pay more attention to potential competition. I'm happy to say the agencies are following her advice. Here's um, the law is uncertain in this. The DOJ has their policies and uh, their antitrust treatises, but this is a particular kind of prediction, right? Is a company that's now not a competitor going to become a competitor? So here's a case. The FTC sues Meta 
for its acquisition of within, which is a virtual reality fitness app. I, I, I did not know what this was, but I saw a clip on it and I saw people dancing around with VR headsets to what appears to be some form of exercise that I could not, I could not do. Um, yeah, this merger goes like this. Meta manufactures virtual reality hardware and runs a, a, a virtual reality app store. So it's in the virtual reality space, okay? But within, well, the product I think is called Supernatural, is in a particular form of virtual reality fitness. And that's viewed as a separate thing from just virtual reality apps generally. Its own market for antitrust purposes. It's pretty highly concentrated, and within is an important player. So the FTC says, look, if Meta buys within, it solidifies the concentration in that market. If it doesn't buy it, what's it going to do? It's going to want to enter it. It's a big player in virtual reality. They'll come into the marketplace. It's not that big a deal. I have no idea. If this, I don't know how virtual reality works. I, only the most tenuous grasp of reality itself. But, um, but you know, if they're doing VR, they're going to come into this space. It's a profitable space. That's Meta is the potential entrance. Meta says, no, nah, we're not going to. Um, and Meta says, no, in fact, within will be stronger. It'll be better off. So which is it going to be? Is Meta going to be a potential entrance whose entry is deterred by the merger, or is within going to be a much stronger competitor? Here's what the district court finds. This is, when you look up Pyrrhic victory in the dictionary next time, remember this case, okay? Especially if you're an antitrust reformer. Good market, well-defined product market. Market is highly concentrated. Potential competition is an antitrust theory. If you can show somebody buying, you know, what would be a threat? Okay, you don't have to show it to 100% certain. We're back to predictions. Reasonable probability of entry, something more than 50%. But the court finds that the FTC loses. It doesn't meet its legal burden of showing the likelihood, sufficient likelihood, I should say, of potential competition. So now we're at maybe at the edges of prediction, as I've tried to emphasize is the key legal issue here. Because now we're talking about prediction of a company that hasn't done something yet. But it's critically important because there's a lot of mergers that have taken place in tech. And that's who I want to finish with. Just a couple of implications. Tech mergers, tech companies merge a lot. Think of the ones that weren't challenged. Or, yeah, we're not just a challenge. Google Fitbit, right? For example, Microsoft LinkedIn, Apple Box. Pays Dr. Dre a billion dollars more for Beats headphones and the software that underlies Apple Music, right? There's a lot of mergers. And then, of course, there's Facebook, the Meta, Instagram, WhatsApp, which is what the FTC is now challenging. Our article argues that horizontal mergers deserve a lot more scrutiny than they received in the past because we think it's too easy to think they'll be benefited. Thirdly, vertical mergers are now getting attention and some success. Um, the Illumina Grail merger that Nancy described is a tech merger. It's in DNA sequencing, and the FTC fundamentally won that decision. Uh, and that was important because it had been a long time before a court had applied a theory of harm in vertical mergers in the U.S., Potential and nascent competition and innovation are very important in dynamic markets, making the predictions that we've discussed extremely important to the application of public policy here. And then finally, I'm calling self-remedy. Really, I promise I'll be good. Gone to very divergent responses. Compare the UK and the US in Microsoft Activision. But US courts seem to like them. Interestingly, in both, in both the AT&T Time Warner Entertainment and in Microsoft Activision, the court said, yeah, the contract's okay without apparently any discussion whether at least 
they should be a legal order, a consent decree that could be reviewed by the antitrust agencies, reviewed by the courts, just for pure contracts subject to private dealing. So with the new merger guidelines in the United States that came out uh, last year, and with the, I would say, more aggressive emphasis on merger enforcement, we're going to learn a lot about this. But what we tried to do today is have Nancy teach us the economics. And I've just tried to emphasize the importance when you think about these issues as public policymakers, think about how you make predictions and which way a prediction will cut and how you look at the evidence, because it's very fact-based, as to what happens in a world that might never exist. Okay. We have a couple of minutes left if there's a question or two. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I was curious about with trying to determine whether or not there's harm that's being caused by elevating prices after a merger. How, how can you decouple all the different factors or variables that could lead to an increased price, like inflation, gas prices, so on and so forth? And, and does the burden kind of just fall down to who has the best economists in the room to prove what the price increase was uh, and what that was attributed to? Was that due to the merger or was it due to outside circumstances? You want to talk about regression analysis? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I think the, the first answer is in terms of, of merger enforcement is that we're making predictive exercises. So we're trying to say in the same environment, what would the merger post-merger price look like versus the, the price look like without the merger. So, so when we're doing those kind of merger simulations of, or predictive exercises, we are holding everything that's fixed. Um, or we're, we're trying our best to do that. In terms of like the types of studies that John mentioned that he and I looked at in, in our paper, merger retrospectives, they're also using typically econometric techniques to try and control for factors. The ideal would be, let's suppose that we had markets that we thought were affected by the merger, say where the two merging parties competed head to head prior to the merger. And we had other markets where maybe only one of those parties was present. And so there wasn't a reduction in competition. If the other conditions, you know, cost, inflation, whatever, are similar across those markets, we can look at what happens to prices in what are called the control markets, the ones not affected by the, the merger, and the ones that happened in the treated markets, that is the ones affected by the reduction in competition, and kind of try to compare those. In some cases, that's, that's easier to do than in others. Um, so it can get pretty complicated. and you know, there, for instance, are a lot of airline retrospectives, and I think those have a lot of challenges. Importantly, I said, remember, we want to worry about mergers where you increase tacit coordination. If the reduction in airlines from, you know, a dozen major carriers to four um, makes it easier for airlines overall to soften competition, we may not have very good control markets to, to sort of say, you know, what would the price have been? without the merger effects. But but economists who are trying to, to learn from past experience do spend a lot of time worrying about exactly that, that set of factors. Let me come to the second part of your question. So is it just about economists? It's not. For the litigator, you're looking for evidence. Again and again, courts are looking at the documents created by, particularly by the merging companies, but also talking to big customers and trying to get a sense. You'd be amazed the frequency with which a review of the documents created by the two merging companies says something like, and this will be good because we get to increase prices. That's a particularly stock example, but this actually turns out to be very important. In the AT&T merger, as Nancy said, Time Warner, the judge completely believed the executives of the merging companies in what they wanted to do. So economic studies are critically important, but they, but there's a lot of evidence that comes in. I think, I think that's basically the time for today. Just to know, we are going to be back on Wednesday. Tasneem Chifty, who was just an expert in the trial in Boston uh, involving JetBlue Spirit, will be with us if any of you all can join. Okay, you can wait. First of all, thank you all for coming, and you should feel free if you have to leave for class. But I have, I gotta, 
I just have a few questions, and I think <laughs> I think Jean has some questions. Maybe we should take this later. But but there there are kind of three pieces of information that when you're thinking about retrospectives on some of these deals, that you didn't really mention, and that may be for good valid legal reasons. Um, and by the way, I have to tell everybody. Yes, I am a reformed AT&T executive. <laughs> uh, I was president of AT&T's international um, operations, and I ran new services for AT&T Wireless, and I helped oversee the sale of AT&T Wireless to Singular, which had to deal with the DOJ and the FCC and all of that. But, 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 um, And I did not do the Time Warner deal. I would have voted against it, having my own experience with buying content companies. Um, but um, one is you didn't talk about the profitability and i'm sitting there looking at the miller example and it's like what did the profitability of the companies look like before and after and relative to other competitors in the industry because if they really were just increasing prices and not getting i mean there's some combination of price increases potentially and, and cost synergies that are real and, and kind of you had the data that looked like you might be able to separate that out a little bit um, but the, the second thing is you didn't look at sh talk about share data um, and like did they pick up lose share or whatever and that's kind of tied to the profitability piece and the third is really around technological change which you did talk about but when you have rapidly changing technology how do you create a structure that protects competition but also enhances technological development and when you have those technological changes my experience at AT&T was, okay, we don't have a wire into the home. We no longer have local businesses. We're long distance. We have to get into the home somehow. Technological change is driving us to, to somehow do that in a different way. Um, how do you take that change into account and make markets resilient to technological change and allow technological change uh, as you go forward? Sorry, that's, a lot. that's probably another two hour discussion. So if you want to punt well, on I'm going to punt on the but... technological change, um, you know, um, uh, um, difficult to predict the future even without that and even more so when it when it is. But I think that's something that that certainly competition authorities care about in terms of merger retrospectives. Um, industrial organization economists are very skeptical of accounting profit data. There are just all kinds of, you know, machinations that happen with that that might make the accounting data unreliable um, measures of economic profits. So um, we've moved away from looking at that, generally speaking. Um, shares are often looked at um, with this idea that if, if price is going up, but shares are expanding, then maybe it's that you're offering a better product. And so even though the price, this goes back to one of the questions I'd answered earlier, even if the price is higher, if you're offering a better product, the overall value might be up. So we do worry about that. I think that, you know, in terms of predicting merger effects or like the Miller Coors paper, they're simulating prices. So they're holding, they're holding factors constant and then saying, suppose I just allow efficiencies to change, or I just allow the behavior of firms with respect to their rivals to change, what would the price path have, have looked like, um, you know, relative to the base? And so I think that's trying to abstract from some of these um, uh, questions about, um, you know, they're just looking at price there, but, I, but you get similar share pred predictions, I think, from that merger simulation there. Real fast, I'm gonna hit you one with one. I want you to um, give us a thought about potential competition. What standard would you apply? Um, you use Meta Within as an example, and the court applied a more than 50% likelihood of, of, uh, of entry. Is that the right standard? It strikes me that's awfully high burden, and maybe that's part of your description of pirate victory. But um, uh, once you win on the market definition, once you win on the level of concentration, um, and then it's just this question of would they have entered on their own? Did they have adequate incentive? And obviously, the evidence was mixed. What kind of a standard do you think makes sense? So for myself, uh, I wouldn't apply a more than 50% standard. Now, it's got to have some likelihood, but the law says, the U.S. law, the effect of such acquisition may be substantially to lessen competition. So I read that to mean it may be 
likely to do something which would be a substantial lessening of competition. So maybe, I, I can't give you a number, but I don't think 50% is the magic number where there's something maybe because it feels to me like preponderance of the evidence suggests it's going to be. And therefore, the I would read it as less than 50%. But you know, you've got to show that it's not just simply imagining flying cars, right? The possibility, and maybe this needs to be a reasonable possibility. Lots of I, I feel as though, Jean, that from my perspective, like almost ideally what you'd like is some kind of sliding scale where if the market seems like a more difficult market to enter, a more entrenched market, then you want a lower probability of, of this one of these competitors entering it um, than if it's something where barriers to entry might be lower. Which then standing up for regulators is when you move from the legal test to a reasonable test, as this discussion just did, yeah. is why you need to have the agility of a regulatory structure in addition to an antitrust structure. Yeah, but you should have a you should have potential competition cases should be easier even without a regulator. So even in industries we never think about regulating, I do. I saw when John said I would march the halls, I saw a lot of what I think were potential competition cases in old style industries like minerals extraction, right? Where did we see those? There was a company in North America or maybe the US, there was a company in South America. They were starting to sell into each other's markets. There was just a tiny bit of interaction. They weren't really actual competitors yet and they decided to merge or in railway equipment, a, Europe com a European company, an American one. And they figured out it was a lot better to merge than it was to try and grab market share by competing with each other. And if they waited too long, they'd be actual competitors and the merger would be challenged. So that's arguing for a potential competition, a viable potential competition standard, even in industries we'd never regulate. But I agree, it's another benefit of regulation in, in industries where it is appropriate to have a regulator. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for staying. Thank you.